I'm Barry Silverberg, Director of the Center for Nonprofit Studies at Austin Community College. Welcome to Civil Society, where we explore issues affecting our communal well being through a nonprofit lens. We're a proud partner of ACC TV. My guest today is Donna Shainer, Director of Clinical Social Work and Integrated Behavioral Health at UT Health Austin. She has experience integrating mental health care into healthcare settings to treat the whole patient, helping them achieve their desired goals and outcomes. In her current role, she supervises the UT Austin social workers in the clinical areas and coordinates integration of social workers within their clinical settings. Donna previously worked at Phoenix House, a residential drug treatment center, and LifeWorks as a therapist. She then went to graduate school, receiving a degree in social work from the University of Texas, and became a licensed social worker and then a licensed chemical dependency counselor. Donna also served two years in the Peace Corps in Costa Rica as a youth development coordinator. She's a distinguished graduate of our Certificate in Nonprofit Leadership and Management class of 2013, which she entered upon returning from Costa Rica. At that time, she noted in her bio narrative that I look forward to continue learning, living life to the fullest, and giving my best in all that I do while applying my strength, resilience, positivity, competence, passion, and unique experiences. Donna, from what I see, and I know you certainly are doing that, and that's great. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. And um, to get started, so you've done a number of things in your time. So what are you proudest of? Hmm. So I think the proudest, I feel the most proud um, being able to be a really good clinician. Um, I'm serving now in a leadership role, but I think the, the, the moments that I feel really, really the strongest and feel the proudest is the, the direct work that I've done with mm -hmm. clients and, and with community and seeing the, the change that we make. What does it take to be a good clinician? So I think, uh, you know, the books and studying, all of that is really important. And to be a good clinician, particularly a, a clinical social worker, right. um, it takes someone to be able to really look at a person in their entire environment, meet people where they are. Um, I think what social work brings is the ability to meet a client where they are in, in their moment in their life, right. as difficult as it might be. And to be able to just really focus on that um, and take yourself out of it and put yourself in their shoes. So in your current role at UT Health, what, what exactly do you do? So I feel like my, my role keeps expanding since I've, I've been there just a little bit under a year. Um, so I am the director of clinical social work and integrated behavioral health. So I supervise. That's a mouthful. It is. It is a mouthful. And I supervise the clinical social workers, the dietitians, and um, integrated behavioral health also includes a clinical pharmacist that specializes in uh, behavioral health. Mm -hmm. And so all of the social workers and dietitians are spread across our clinical enterprise. There are many, many different specialty clinics in UT Health Austin, right. and there's a social worker in just about every clinic. And so part of my role is ensuring that everyone is integrated smoothly um, with all of the medical providers, the physical therapists, the dietitians, and all the other disciplines, the medical assistants, the nurses, um, providing the best care for our patients. What are some of the greatest challenges that when you're doing that? Aside from working with people, which is always a challenge, but <laughs> yeah. what, what are some of the challenges that you face on a daily basis? So I think I think the one of the biggest challenges um, is a reflection of what's going on, and I think in our country with healthcare and policy. So we want to be able to meet the needs of all of our patients, um, just like anyone in healthcare. You mm -hmm. go into this because you want to help, and um, health sh health insurance doesn't always align with the way that we do things. Right. Um, there are a lot of barriers that are, are put there that, that won't allow us to do some of the care that we want to um, and that our patients deserve. So I think um, on a policy level, being able to advocate for some change for um, insurance companies and how healthcare policy across the nation is should change, at least in our state, mm -hmm. um, whether it's insurance companies, payers, hospital systems. Um, so clinicians just want to get in there and they want to help. Clinicians want to go in and they want to they just solve the problem. They want to solve the problem. They want to help. Um, so I think the biggest challenge for our clinical social workers and I think all of the providers there are uh, when those policies get in the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I remember when you were in in our certificate program, nonprofit leadership and management. Um, you described yourself as I think unique and different. Okay, because yeah. of your background. <laughs> okay. And I was fascinated by the Costa Rica experience and mm -hmm. and so forth. So. 
what, what about your background makes you unique and different? And at the same time, um, I assume that led you to what you're doing right now. So why sure. are you doing what you're doing right now? Okay, so there's a story to why I chose social work. Um, so I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, I'm, I'm biracial and I, I would say tricultural. I was uh, born in Colombia, South America to an Afro-Colombian mother and um, a white American father who grew up in Oklahoma originally and traveled all through uh, the world, it landed in Colombia, mm -hmm. met my mom, got married, had me, and then a few months later we were in Oklahoma. Um, and so I grew up, if you know anything about Tulsa, you know that it's a historically segregated city. Um, there's a lot of history, so it's a relatively safe city overall. Uh, it's the heart of the Bible Belt, um, and it comes with a lot of history. So the Tulsa race riots or the, right. the Tulsa massacre in 1921, um, the racial division that exists, the divide of the, the railroad track there. And so I grew up on the south side, which is a historically white part of town. Um, I spoke Spanish. Um, obviously, I'm a person of color. I was in the gifted and talented classes throughout school, and um, I just didn't fit into anybody's box in little Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and so I had to learn how to be resilient. Um, I really had to understand, um, and my parents did a great job of, of telling me who I am and where I come from. Um, so from both, you know, whether it was my peers that are white or my peers that were black um, or Latinx, I wasn't enough, so I wasn't black enough, I wasn't Latina enough, I wasn't, you know, or I was trying to act too white. Yeah. So there were all these um, challenges in terms of like trying to, I had to really get really clear about who I was in terms of my identity. Um, and my parents did a really good job of making sure that I knew exactly where I come, came from and what my value system was. Um, so I had to get really strong about that from, from being really little. And that led me all the way to kind of where I am now. When I was a senior in high school, I went to Booker T. Washington High School in Tulsa, which is a magnet school. It's a really good school. Um, it's on the north side of town. And uh, my senior year, we took a child psychology class. And in my group, we had group work. The first semester, I needed to, we we're supposed to observe a, a fifth grade class um, over two semesters. So the first semester, we decided what would it be like if we interviewed and observed an elementary school on the south side of town, same street, but the south side of town, um, which is a historically white and uh, higher SES. Um, and then the next semester, interview and observe someone on the north side. School, fifth, same fifth grade, same school district, right? Um, same street, just on the north side. Um, so I remember walking into uh, the school on the south side with my group, and there are tennis balls up on, the, on the little chairs. There were, it was vibrant. There were colors, there were flowers, and landscaping, and the walls mm -hmm. said, my mommy is a doctor, and my daddy's a lawyer, and it was just full of life, and looked like great, healthy, happy people. Um, it was great. We watched the fifth graders and learned a little bit. The next semester, we went to um, the north side school, um, predominantly African-American on a side of town that was, it was rough. Um, I remember walking into that school with my group and um, it felt like being in a jail. It felt like being in a prison. There was no landscape, there was no green outside. Uh, there was leaking on the water coming down from the ceiling, puddles in the, on the, and it wasn't clean. Yeah. Um, the kids uh, were at risk of failing the fifth grade and um, I had a lot of questions, you know. Uh, how is this the same school district? Um, why are these kids doing so poorly? What is their life like? What is their story? Um, and over that whole semester, we decided to go ahead and start tutoring those kids. Um, uh -huh. We spent about an hour or two a week with them through the semester, and uh, they were able to, to graduate. Um, and so as a 17-year-old me, um, seeing that I was able to impact some change in children's lives just for doing that little bit, which I didn't think was that much, um, but I was able to really change their lives and the group that was with me also. Um, it's one of the reasons why I chose social work. It is the reason why I chose social work. Yeah. That's, I, I wanted to address all of those questions that I had as a 17-year-old in Tulsa, um, seeing these differences. So now that you're slightly older than 17, mm -hmm. okay, if you were talking to that 17-year-old, what would you have told her? 
I think I would tell a 17-year-old me to, to take more risks. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to ask uh, questions and not know the answer all the time. I think, um, I think that, I think also think as a, as a woman in leadership, um, we have, you know, some barriers that, that are a little bit different than men, quite different than what men experience. And I think that I, I, I would have, I would have told 17 year old me to push a little bit more, to take more risks, put myself out there. Uh, that it's going to be okay. And if I, if I fall, I fall. Yeah. Interesting. So right now you're leading and managing. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your leadership style? So I would definitely describe my leadership style as relational. Um, what a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say I'm definitely relational. I am okay with being vulnerable. I'm okay with being humble. And I like to role model that for my team. Um, I think that we grow that way. I think we get better that way. Um, and I think relationship and really same thing, just like social work, you know, we want to know, we, we meet the client where they are. It's the same thing with, uh, with my team. I want to know what, what's their vision. What do they think about when they want UT Health Austin or whatever organization I'm with um, to grow? I, I want them to be part of the vision also. And mm -hmm. so we have a relationship and a conversation about what that would look like. So your role models mm -hmm. as you're growing up, obviously your parents played a very important role in your social and psychological development. Mm -hmm. Who were some of the other role models that you've had along the way? Um, I would say, def well, my mother is number one. Um, my, my mother was a, uh, is a rock um, and a very strong, strong woman um, who faced a lot of adversity and still overcame. Uh, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather was also um, a strong mentor in my life. Um, also pushed me to, to do the right thing always. Um, what a pain that is. Yeah. Always doing the right thing. And you know, he's been, he's been, um, he's passed away and it's been several years and I still, I still think about like, what would granddaddy say? You know, oh, granddaddy would definitely think this. Yeah. 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 Have you had any professional role models uh, in terms of your? Yeah, I have been really lucky. I think all through my professional career, I have been really lucky in having really good supervisors, um, and have, they have mentored me um, throughout my entire career. So um, whether it was at Phoenix House or LifeWorks or um, El Buen, where I just came from, and in Peace Corps, I always had someone, and where I am now, UT Health Austin, um, I've always had good supervisors, and they have been strong mentors for me, and I've asked them to, to help me in a mentorship role, and they all have. So let's turn for a minute to the theme of the show, mm -hmm. uh, treating the whole person. Yeah. Okay. So what, what's, what does that concept mean, and how is it different than perhaps traditional care, or maybe it is traditional care? Yeah, I would love for treating the whole person to end up being care as usual or traditional care. Um, when we think about healthcare, we typically kind of think about physical health being from the neck down and uh, mental health being, you know, here up. and. Um, really separating the two. When I went to graduate school um, years ago, that's kind of how we were trained. Um, so treating the whole person is looking at the entire person, that their emotional, spiritual, mental, um, social life um, is also going to affect their physical health outcomes. And so when we treat the whole person, um, they're not just a case of diabetes, they're not just a, a person that has MS or a person who um, has bipolar disorder, we're looking at the whole story. Every single patient that's in front of us has a story. And right. when we start there, instead of looking at them as a diagnosis, um, our patients are gonna get better. We're gonna provide better care. Yep. Um, and I like to think about integrated care as everyone's stretching. So that means that the clinical social workers, the dietitians, the PharmD, the medical providers, uh, the specialists, everyone is kind of stretching a little bit. Um, to provide that whole person care instead of saying, well, I only work with this organ because I'm a surgeon <laughs> or I only uh, deal with the mental health because I'm the clinical social worker or uh, I'm only looking at their, their blood pressure. What is that person's story and how can we impact change by actually listening to them and, and seeing what the patient wants? Um, whole, whole person centered care is also starting where the patient is. So if they don't want to uh, take medication, for example, 
why? They might have a really good reason. What if we bring a clinical social worker in there to talk about it and see what some of the concerns are? Maybe we can make some changes that way. Mm -hmm. So having too many experiences in the hospital, okay? Mm -hmm. Not experiencing, I mean, the only time that I saw a social worker mm -hmm. uh, was for the exit process, yeah. okay? Yep. So what is the role of the clinical social worker, the people you supervise mm -hmm. in the treatment of the whole person? Yep. Because on the face of it, it seems the way, well, it's a no brainer, that's the way it should be. But I think anybody who spent time in a hospital knows mm -hmm. that's not the way it is. Right. So what, what should that role be? Mm -hmm. So and it's interesting, I think that social work we kind of had a, have a good and a bad problem about this is a good and a bad thing that we are so broad in what we do. Um, social workers, I think the, the stereotype of social work is that maybe we provide uh, bus passes and we're discharging in a hospital and um, we call CPS or we are CPS, right? It's kind of the, the stereotype of social work. And social work is incredibly broad and rich. So at UT Health Austin, the clinical social workers um, provide the mental health support that is needed and on top of that, I kind of call it that they're co-managing a medical condition with okay. the patient and the medical provider. And they're helping connect those dots that um, otherwise wouldn't be connected. So um, whether that's helping them get some transportation or address um, some of the mental health support that they need, um, whether that's helping with some medical leave that they need, um, but it's really listening. And, and a lot of what they do is motivational interviewing. So they're helping impact health, health behaviors and changes. Um, so not just come in, do this, here's a bus ticket, you know, or come and see me for psychotherapy, but what are your goals? What do you want to get out of this when you come to the, visit us at UT Health mm -hmm. Austin? And how can we help you get there? And it looks different for every patient. So what's really neat is that a clinical social worker's job is very, very different. It looks different for everyone. So every patient should be seeing a I mean, uh, that should be part of the care practice? It can be, right? So um, we screen at UT Health Austin, we screen all of our patients um, that come in for any medical visit. They get screened for depression, anxiety, um, and some other issues, right? Whether it's sleep or pain. Right. Um, and if they screen positive, they have the option to talk to one of the clinical social workers um, if, they, if they would like. Um, if if the, there's something, for example, a case consult might happen when um, someone needs to lose weight for surgery. So we have two social workers in our um, orthopedics or musculoskeletal clinic, specialty clinic. So you would think, I think that's pretty, when I think about social work and specialty clinics, I don't think of one, or I don't start and think, oh, definitely an ortho, right? Um, and we have two, it's one of our busiest clinics. And those, that's a great example of really integrating care. So the social workers are very much part of the treatment. Um, so let's say someone needs to have a hip replacement or a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. Um, the social worker can come in and help talk about all the life changes. Have you ever been to a doctor and they tell you, you need to lose weight, you need to change your diet, you need to do this, you put all these things, every has it week, ever happened? Every week. <laughs> right. And you walk out with like all these instructions of major life changes. And super motivated for the first time. Oh minutes. yeah, you're to oh, you, totally, before you, you get in but your car. But then there's the Krispy Kreme in front exactly, of you. Exactly, and then what do you do, right? That's right. So what social work helps with is how. How am I gonna lose weight? How am I gonna start exercising? Um, and if you're really, mot how am I gonna stop smoking if I need to, to, to stop smoking in order to get the surgery? If you're really motivated to get that knee surgery or that hip surgery, that's where social work can help motivate those health behavior changes. So looking back, okay, um, what do you wish you had known along the way? Um, I think I wish I would have known. And what would you like to, somebody who's, a course like yours, yeah. somebody who might be biracial or feels yeah. different in one way or another, yeah. you know. Um, you know. I would say, I, I wish I would have known that it's okay to ask for help and say, I'm having a hard time with this. Um, I'm finding that the more that I, I, I do that, I, I'm seeking out mentorship more now, particularly in a space where um, I am a minority. Um, I, 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 I make a deliberate effort to make sure and look for, for some people that can help mentor me in that. So vulnerability is okay. It's okay to be vulnerable. Um, it's a double-edged sword, I think, with people of color and for women, right? Yes. Um, so uh, we have to come off as really strong and I have to have it together and I've got to know all the answers. If I don't, I may be seen as, you know, weak or incompetent. incompetent. And so 
I feel like a lot of times I feel like I always have to know the answer. I've got to have it together. And so I think it's finding the allies and the right people who are truly going to mentor and 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 it's okay. I found I found out that people actually don't know what they're doing sometimes in leadership, and it's okay. And they ask, and they ask other people. And had I known that earlier on, I think that would have helped me a lot. And um, and that's our, part our of entire program our is based on that. Yes, it is. <laughs> And it's okay to ask and to network, right? And to, um, it's okay if you don't know the answer. And if you have some ideas, share it, bounce it off of someone. Um, people do that. And I, I don't know that that's really shared as much as it could be. So you spent a year as part of our certificate program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you had just come back from Costa Rica, and I mm -hmm. assume it was kind of a re reintroduction to whatever <laughs> you were being reintroduced to. Yeah. Um, how did it impact on you? How, how what did you find useful about it? From the program? Yes. And, and make something up, because nothing is a terrible answer. <laughs> so um, what, what I really liked about the program was, um, so I've always been a natural leader, is what I've been told, right? I mean, ever since I was younger, I've always been a natural leader. I've been told that. And I remember being in Costa Rica in my little town that I was living in, looking at the program and saying, oh, this, this seems like the next step for me. Um, how can I really learn the the fundamentals of, of working in a nonprofit mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. And so being able to study that for a year and really take a look at how um, nonprofits work and don't work um, and what helps them tick and what doesn't help them tick. Um, everything from, I remember the governance one was really something, the govern governance section was really important. Great presenter. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's <was> great. <laughs> uh, really stuck out to me. I really liked, um, I forgot her name, but the one who talked about your elevator speech and being really comfortable with that. Um, she used to be on NPR and do the fundraising. Yeah. Um, so just being able to, it, it, the social media aspect of how important that was. So it helped me become a better leader and become an official leader, I think, in an official capacity and really step into saying, hey, I think I can do this. I know I can do this. Uh, I think I need a promotion. Um, <laughs> Eventually, I was able to do that, and um, it, it also helps me be a better leader to understand how nonprofit organizations work. Um, so when I explain to uh, my team about, well, we got to look at the numbers and we've got to look at the data, um, I understand, and we have governance, right? And understanding a little bit more about yeah. that, it helps. It helps me help them understand some of the things that on the ground is hard to understand. So in the work you do particularly since you're up against this mammoth healthcare system, mm -hmm. okay? How do you deal with the frustration that inevitably happens when one of your colleagues comes to you and says, we can't get X done because the, quote, system mm -hmm. gets in the way? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. How do I handle that? Well, well what do you tell them to do and then how do you handle it because yeah. I know you just a little bit, but mm -hmm. my sense is you absorb that mm -hmm. frustration as well. Totally. I do. And um, I think about the patients that are not getting what they need, right? So I think I, I definitely have that uh, empathy, and I know that the social workers do too. And so what I, I, tell the, I tell my team is I validate and say, absolutely, this is frustrating. I, I understand why this is frustrating. I try to problem solve with them. Um, social workers are great problem solvers, by the way we are incredibly resourceful. So we put our heads together and try to figure out what we can do for that particular patient. And then I think on a policy level, I'm keeping track of how many people were turning away, right? Or uh, or not able to help in this way. Building a case. Building a case because um, I know that our organization and any organization that's in healthcare wants to do the right thing. Um, but the big behemoth that is healthcare policy is a huge barrier many times. So um, I think if we, as a leader in my organization, get with other leaders in the organization, we put all of our information together and um, hopefully share that with senior leadership and, and make changes that way. Well, we've come to the end. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that was fast. I really thank you for being here. I, this has been fascinating. And obviously I wish you the very best. And I think UT Health is lucky to have you as part of its core leadership team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. Thank you for watching Civil Society, and thank you to ACC-TV for producing this show. You can read more about Donna Shainer 
and view previous episodes at nonprofitaustin.org slash civil society. Thank you.